What's up guys? This is part 2 of the Ultimate Mnemonics for the Step 1 exam series. If you haven't watched part 1, I'll leave a link in the description. Today we're going to talk about the respiratory system. So carbon dioxide transport has two effects, Haldane and Bohr. So for Haldane effect, I think about the lungs in which we, uh, are ox we breathe in oxygen and that binds hemoglobin and then protons are released. My trick is that Haldane effect sounds like halothane, an inhaled anesthetic, and that helps me remember that Haldane has to do with the lungs. Bohr effect would be the opposite, where oxygen unloads from hemoglobin and proton, a proton will bind. The trick for me is to remember that this, this happens in the Bori or the body. Lung cancers like squamous carcinoma and small cell carcinoma, which both start with an S, are both central and due to smoking. So imagine central starts with an S as well. There is an exception to this. Large cell carcinoma does not start with an S, but it has a large or strong association with smoking, and you will see giant cells for large cell carcinoma. Some of the drugs that you'll need to know include loratadine, which is a second generation antihistamine. And for this, I just think of loratadine as loratudine. If you want an example of a first generation antihistamine, this would be diphenhydramine. And the way I remember this one as a first generation is that one of the things it blocks is alpha. It is an alpha blocker. To me, alpha sounds like one. So I remember it as first generation. Another drug to know is bosentin. This is an endothelin 1 antagonist. So what I do is I think of the N E, sorry, the E N in bosentin as bosendothelin 1. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but it works for me. Some antileukotrines include Montelukast and Sapirlukast, which, which sound like leukotrienes to me, and these are going to block the leukotriene receptor. Another drug called Siluton also sounds like leukotrienes, but this instead blocks the synthesis of leukotrienes rather than the receptors. That concludes the respiratory part. Moving on to part three of the ultimate mnemonics for the step one, we're going to talk about the renal system. Regarding the tubules, we'll start with the PCT or proximal convoluted tubule. And this is me being off record, but if you don't know the answer, pick PCT above all other tubules because it is most likely the correct answer and that is your best shot. A lot of things happen in the PCT and this is an example of it. The trick to know the um, concentrations of reabsorption to secretion in that order for me is the mnemonic go away home and keep clutching until concentration pays off. Now I know this is a long mnemonic but I feel like it's uh, pretty relatable and hopefully easier to remember. Now let's go through that again. Go away home and keep clutching until concentration pays off. In the image below, you can see from the bottom up that all of this res um, represents glucose, amino acids, bicarbonate, sodium, potassium, chloride, urea, inulin or GFR, creatinine, and paraaminohyporic acid or PAH. Also, the PCT will be the most affected by hypoxia. PCT, most susceptible to hypoxia. The distal convoluted tubules will be the one that contains the most dilute urine. That is the DCT, distal convoluted tubule, most dilute urine. And if you search for the image of the tubules, you will see that at the very top, there is less osmolarity in the tubules, whereas at the bottom, for example, in the thin uh, loop of Henle and in the collecting ducts, you'll have a higher osmolarity and a more concentrated urine. For glomerulopathies, we've got two confusing ones here, and that is granulomatosis with polyangiitis and microscopic polyangiitis. Now, they do sound similar, but you need to know the markers for it. So granulomatosis with polyangiitis will be um, marked by C. anca antibodies and PR3 anca. The trick for me is, this is called Wegener's. I switch the G to a C and call it Wegener's. And that C represents the C anchor. 
For microscopic polyangiitis, this is going to be targeted with P. anca and MPO. And my trick is to take um, words from the actual name to form MPO, and that is microscopic polyangiitis. Also, if you know that the other one is Weckener and it's with C. anca, now you know this one is with P. anca. A good trick for glomerulopathies is that everything that ends in phritis is going to be a type 3 hypersensitivity. So I like to think of it as glomerulonephritis. And an example of type 2 hypersensitivity would be good pasture syndrome. A good way to remember the location of the ureters, which is under the uterine artery for females and under the vas deferens in males, is to remember that water goes under the bridge. For ACE inhibitors, which are renal arteriolar vasoconstrictors, I like to take the letters and spell out that ACE inhibitors constrict efferent. For renal cell carcinoma, which is going to cause accumulation of lipid droplets, I like to also take the letters and spell out uh, and form renal clear cells, RCC. And also, um, this is going to be caused by a deletion of chromosome 3, and there are three letters in RCC. Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease happens in adults, unlike autosomal recessive PKD, which happens in infants. So to remember this, I take the AD for autosomal dominant and use it for the word adult onset. Thiazide diuretics are going to, as a side effect, increase glucose, lipids, uric acid, and calcium. And a good trick to remember this is hyperglup. Aniskirin, or aniskirin, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, um, is going to be a renin inhibitor. And the way I remember this is I write down aniskirenin, and that tends to help. All right, that concludes this video. Thank you for watching, study hard, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.